Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done nearly 650 of them now. If this, if you haven't seen any of these before and you want to check out previous ones, go to bathgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu, where you'll see them all organized in various ways. Uh, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. I say listeners because it also exists as an audio podcast. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there are PayPal buttons on the website and there's a page which suggests alternatives to PayPal if you prefer some alternative. My guest today is uh, a good friend, Dwayne Elgin. I'm, I've had him on the show before. I think it was five years ago or so. Um, he is an internationally recognized speaker, author, and social visionary. He has an MBA in business and MA in economic history. His books include Choosing Earth, Awakening Earth, Voluntary Simplicity, and The Living Universe. He has worked as a senior staff member of the Presidential Commission on the American Future and a senior social scientist co-authoring numerous studies on the long-range future for clients such as the President's Science Advisor, the National Science Foundation, and others. Duane has also co-authored three nonprofit organizations working for media accountability and citizen empowerment. He received the Peace Prize of Japan, the Goy Award, in recognition of his contribution to a global vision, <clears throat> um, consciousness, and lifestyle that fosters a more sustainable and spiritual culture. Dwayne is the co-director of the Choosing Earth Project. He also co-wrote a book by with Joseph Campbell. Um, I'd like to I'm not I'd like to read some blurbs on the back of his book, not to plug the book, but to emphasize the importance of the conversation we're going to have today. And in many respects, in some respects, I think this may be one of the most important conversations I've I've had on this program. And as time goes on over the decades, I think. It'll be recognized, the things we'll talk about today will be recognized as the most important things we could have been talking about at this time. So here are a few blurbs. This is from Gene Houston, who has been on Bad Cap. Choosing Earth is the most important book of our time. To read and dwell within it is an awakening experience that can activate both an ecological and spiritual revolution. This one is from Irvin Laszlo, we'd love to have on Bad Gap, a, a truly essential book for our time from one of the greatest and deepest thinkers of our time. This is from Joanna Macy. This may be the perfect moment for so prophetic a voice to be heard. And let's see, uh, read more here, Lynn Twist. Uh, Lynn has been in back not long ago. Choosing Earth is timely, relevant, clear, potent, and absolutely brilliant. Um, so as you'll see, as we get into this conversation, um, well, let, let me turn it over to you, Duane, because I've talked enough for, for starters. Um, why do you think this, what, why don't you give a peop, keep people a nutshell version of what we are going to talk about and why you think it's as important as I obviously do? Well, uh, first of all, it's a delight to be here with you, Rick. Uh, you're one of my favorite interviewers. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, why is this important? Uh, the world is in a time of profound transition. And um, we can look at this in, in various ways, but I'm suggesting that we go really deep and, and look through the trauma of our times beyond the gloom and doom to a, to a time of profound uh, transformation for the entire species. There's never been a time like this in human history. So that's the uh, arc of uh, conversation I'd like to have here today. Good. And when you say gloom and doom, it's funny because as I was reading your book, I was on board with what you were saying, but I was th putting myself in the mindset of some people who might read it, who might think, yeah, this guy's a bummer. He's being so pessimistic. I mean, things aren't this bad, are they? Mm -hmm. And I've actually you know, talked to people 
had conversations with, talk about climate change where they say, well, you know, it's all been overblown. I mean, Al Gore was saying things 20 years ago that didn't come to pass. And Greta Thunberg is just overexcited young girls. She should go back to school. You know, think all this doomsday stuff is just an exaggeration and it's really not going to be that bad and isn't that bad and so on and so forth. So I mean, what would you say to put those people, uh, give them a clearer perspective perhaps? Uh, I would suggest that we take the long view. Um, I've been looking at these trends as a futures researcher uh, for truly a half century now. And uh, these trends grow slowly but inexorably. And it's a vice in which humanity is going to find itself and we either rise uh, to a new level of maturity and consciousness and communication or we're going to collapse and fall into a, a really dire uh, circumstance. But that is not something that happens swiftly, but it's slow but it's inexorable and it's underway now. Uh, we see it, for example, here, I live in California, the droughts, uh, historic, uh, the fires, historic. Uh, we're burning up on the west, we're getting flooded on the east. Uh, the world is in transition profoundly and we can speak about this. Yeah, um, you know, as you may know, I was a student of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and I was on a boat ride with him on Lake Lucerne in about 1974 or five. And he was talking about their a, a coming phase transition, he called it. And, he, you know, it, he didn't like to he, to scaremonger, but he said, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of heavy. I mean, he didn't use that yeah. word either, but, he, 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 you know, and people were saying, well, yeah. what can we do about this? You know, how, how can we survive this? And he said, well, most fundamentally, hold on to the self. By that he meant capital S self, you know, know, yeah. know thyself, and that will be your most secure foundation. And that, and so I got interested in the whole idea. And I remember in early 80s, I read a book called um, Prophecies and Predictions Everyone's Guide to the Coming Changes by a woman named Moira Timms. And what she did was she took the prophecies of ancient cultures from around the world and she correlated them with historical events which had actually come to pass. And then she, you know, brought it up to the present day and then kind of took their continuing process, prophecies, which hadn't happened yet, and painted a scenario much like the one you paint in your book, um, kind of like your third option, which we'll get to as we go along here, which is that, you know, it's going to be rough, but we could rise out of this to a much better civilization. And before turning it back to you, I just want to read a quote from your book. This is from Gus Speth former director of the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, he said, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystems collapse, and climate change, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. And right. I just wanna say that that statement encapsulates what has been my fundamental motivation since I was 21 years old when I became a meditation teacher because I felt like you know consciousness is most fundamental and um you know you remember the new dimensions radio with my Michael and Justine Toms that was great it used to be on NPR and their little tagline at the beginning was it is only through a change in consciousness that the world will be changed um so that was what I dedicated my life to and I'm still doing so, although there were some diversions where I had to earn a living and stuff. But I just felt like consciousness has the greatest leverage. It's the most fundamental thing. And if we can enliven that, um, we'll have the biggest impact. And frankly, I would be very pessimistic if I didn't recognize that level of life and recognize that there seems to be some kind of global awakening taking place um, simultaneous with a global collapse, which already seems to be underway. Yes. Well, <clears throat> we are going somewhere. Uh, people think, well, this is pretty much it. Uh, we live in a non-living universe. It's a dead universe. Uh, what, what more is there? Uh, well, we are just touching the surface of life uh, when we look at it in that way. And it's with the new consciousness, a deeper consciousness, that we look beneath the surface of life uh, to the deep aliveness that all the world's wisdom to 
traditions and teachers have spoken about. And it is that would, that awakens a new sensibility and a new sense of potential for the human journey. So uh, that's something that, that is foundational uh, to, to my view of where we're going as well. Yeah, I pulled a couple more quotes from your book on this. You said, um, if the universe is viewed as dead at its foundations, then it is natural to exploit the earth and use it up. If the universe is viewed as alive at its foundations, then it is natural to cherish the earth and care for it. And uh, Plato, you quoted as saying, as having said, the universe is a single living creature that contains all living creatures within it. Einstein said, we are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments and our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. So I just want to throw those in because there are some beautiful quotes you put in your book. Great, great. Um, well, let's back up a little bit here, okay? because I really want to get into exactly what you're pointing to now, but to, uh, to enter that um, from where the dominant culture is, finds itself right now. And uh, we're just waking up as a, uh, as a culture, as a species, and we're beginning to say, well, what pathways lie before us? Uh, we see these extraordinary trends of, of climate change, species extinction, uh, resource depletion, we're running out of fresh water, 40% of the people on the planet are already water stressed, we have extraordinary inequities of wealth and well-being around the, uh, around the world. Uh, this cannot hold. This cannot hold. So change is underway of necessity. And, but then the question is, what kind of change? What are the possibilities uh, for, for the future? And after decades of research, uh, I finally come to three possible pathways. And I don't think any one of these is going to be dominant in the near future. It's going to take a while for them to play themselves out. Um, but the three pathways are, one, a pathway of functional extinction. We are no longer a, a powerful player in, in the evolutionary process of the planet. So one is functional extinction. A second is uh, just crushing authoritarianism. We be, we're already seeing the, uh, that come alive in the world now. And a third is the one that you, Rick, and I have been drawn to with our lives, and that is deep transformation. So why don't we take a look at the uh, first video uh, that really presents these three pathways uh, for, for the audience. Okay, good. It'll take me just a minute to get that up on screen. When we look from a big picture perspective, we can see three dominant pathways emerging in response to the global mega crisis. The first pathway is one of crash and collapse. It's a business as usual approach where we make small changes that do not upset the status quo. In making only small gradual changes, systems unravel and this culminates in a devastating evolutionary crash and the collapse of civilizations around the Earth. The second pathway is an authoritarian future that is empowered with artificial intelligence. Collapse is prevented, but at the cost of human freedom and creativity. A digital dictatorship controls our future. The third pathway is one of great transition. The old world is breaking down and a new world is being born. An awakening consciousness fosters a deepening relationship with all of life. We weave together a new world with a higher level of potential and purpose. This is the visual of the crash and collapse pathway. All three pathways have the same beginning. Uh, they start with a time of great unraveling in the 2020s, followed by a great fall, a free fall in the 2030s, and followed then by a time of great sorrow in the 2040s. There are two sets of arrows. The blue arrows represent the direction the planet is headed. The yellow arrows represent the movement that is emerging for transformation. 
you'll notice that on the crash pathway, the yellow arrows are very thin. Continuing business as usual with a focus on growth, extraction, and separation means the collapse will become a devastating crash and could end in functional extinction. Now let's look at the visual for the authoritarian pathway. Like the crash pathway, it shows a time of great unraveling, followed by a great fall, and then followed by a time of great sorrow. Again, there are only a few yellow arrows representing transformation coming in to help. Just before the crash, authoritarian controls pull back the momentum which produces a stagnant future, one of constraint and conformity. It may also produce ruthless leaders making decisions for all. Like the crash and authoritarian pathways, the Great Transition Pathway starts with a time of great unraveling, followed by a great fall, and then followed by a time of great sorrow. On the Great Transition Pathway, there are many more uplifting arrows moving through the 20s and 30s. The yellow arrows represent our growing up as a species, our awakening consciousness, and our concern and care for the well-being of all life. As the yellow arrows come into the time of great sorrow, they provide the uplift for a great transition. So if we are to realize a great transition, it will require humanity to grow into our maturity and awaken our compassion and awareness so we can create a movement of movements. That means you and me and all of us showing up for life on Earth. All three pathways are likely to continue to varying degrees. The question is, which one will guide us into the future? And which one will your actions support? What I, what I get when I watch that is, uh, like you just said, all three pathways are happening now. I mean, you can see places like China, very authoritarian. You know, they're doing facial recognition on everybody. If you jaywalk, you get in trouble. And, um, then there are, you know, well, you, you can you elaborate. I mean, I, I don't have to state the obvious, but then, then the, the, you know, you and I are perhaps shooting some yellow arrows. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's all these people who, just want to do little bitsy witsy incremental change or no change at all. You know, um, every time there's a school shooting, Oh no, we can't really change anything. Um, or, you know, we can't stop mining coal or, or drilling for oil and, and uh, you know, and they sp spend millions of dollars on disinformation to try to uh, convince people that, you know, there are two sides to this issue and it's, the, the, the science isn't settled. That's right. Yeah. This is a time of just profound confusion, turbulence, breakdown, unraveling. Um, and it's, it has been predictable. I've been writing about the unraveling uh, coming in this decade oh, for 40 uh, years or more. So it's, it's something that we could anticipate emerging given the, the driving trends I, I mentioned at the outset. So here we are as a species, uh, and it's a time of profound, in my estimation, initiation. And we are being asked by the uh, forces that we have unleashed ourselves. We're doing this to ourselves. Um, the, we're being asked to go from our adolescence and into our early adulthood. And I've gone around the earth for the last 40 some years and giving talks and often while well, I will start a talk by asking an audience in different parts of the world, if you look at the human family, what life stage are we in? Are we in a toddler stage, an adolescent stage? an adult or an elder stage. And uh, I ask people not only to raise their hands often, but to stand up for their point of view. Take a stand for how you see humanity. And I'll ask, well, how many feel uh, that we're in a toddler stage? About 5% or so will stand up. Terrible twos. And, yes, I've had a guy say that to me a few weeks ago. We're in our <laughs> <Yeah>. terrible twos. <laughs> yes. And 
I ask, well, how about the adolescent stage? How many people feel uh, that we're in our adolescence as a species? And overwhelmingly, two-thirds to three-quarters of every audience I've asked around the world immediately stands up. And they said, yes, we're behaving like teenagers, like adolescents. And, um, and then I say, well, look, this is good news. What? Yes, this is good news because the next step beyond our adolescence is our early adulthood. But to get into our early adulthood, we go through a time of initiation. And virtually everyone can speak to their own adolescence and say, wow, this was hard. This is difficult uh, for me to move through these uh, years in front and move into my early adulthood. So this is a time of profound initiation that we're going through right now. And I'd like to uh, ask you, Rick, to play then the next video about um, our, our time of initiation. Okay, I will. And let me just say before I do that, that, sure. you know, not all teenagers make it through adolescence. Some die, right. of, die of drug overdoses or suicide, or they end up in jail, or they end up damaging themselves severely in ways that handicap them for life. So it's not a done deal. That's right. Very important. That's yeah. right. There's no guarantees we're going to make it through this time of transition. Yeah. Okay. So I'm playing, I'm getting ready for the next video here. Great turning, which is what? It's a transition we're in. We're in it now. It's a transition. We're learning so much in science and in grassroots community building. It's not something we do instead of the collapse. It's something that can guide us through it. My preposition these days is through. Honey, we're going to have to go through this. The opportunity of this time is for us to evaluate and reassess our priorities as a species. We need to look at what our relationships are to each other, to our families, to our community, and really assess our values. We've arrived at a species level conversation, our species, and we need to own this to find a path forward. We have entered an extraordinarily rare moment in humanity's collective journey. The path for generations to come will depend on people alive today. We cannot predict where humanity will go from here for one simple reason. Our future depends on our individual and collective consciousness and the choices that emerge from that consciousness. There's the theme that you brought up earlier, Rick, our consciousness, uh, how we see and, and appreciate the world as well as in a reflective way ourselves and our reawakening to our higher potentials and possibilities or not. And uh, our future in many ways depends upon waking up. And, and seeing that we are not only biological beings, but we're a part of a living universe. We're biocosmic beings. And we'll talk about that as an uplift in a bit. Um, but right now, uh, what I would say, two key factors for our uh, evolution are, first of all, are we growing up, just maturing as a species? We just talked about that. Uh, can we move into our early adult, adulthood, move beyond the reckless years of our adolescence? Uh, we're recklessly uh, just destroying the ecology of life on the planet. Uh, can we move beyond the kind of superficial view uh, of life, uh, beneath the uh, kind of materialism and consumerism of our current current culture, uh, move beyond role models that are, um, let's say, sports stars, music idols, uh, movie stars, and so on. Can we move to a deeper level of recognition of the, um, of the nature of life and, and the journey uh, that we're on? Um, so the one challenge 
is simply growing up as a species. Uh, another is what you've mentioned at the outset, and that is waking up. Can we wake up to not only our thinking brain, but to the reflective consciousness that we all embody? And that you mentioned Einstein, uh, that uh, as a, the, our bodies are carriers of this larger awareness, this larger know, knowing that connects us with the ecology of life. Um, so the challenge now is to wake up uh, to who we are and then to grow into that as a, as a species, as a species, not simply individuals, but collectively uh, mature and grow into that. What an extraordinary time that we're living in right now. Uh, what an amazing invitation of transformation and transition uh, is being offered to us. Yeah. And one th- good point about the growing up as a species um, is that we are all connected. And, um, you know, you may remember that the the TM movement was doing experiments where they try to get large groups of people to meditate together. And there are various theories about how if 1% of the population were to do this, or if even the square root of 1% of the population were, it would kind of change collective consciousness so not everybody would have to do such things which is unrealistic to expect um and there were some studies which seem to show statistical significance um that in fact when we got you know seven or eight thousand people together meditating um there would be a drop in crime and an improvement in, in economic factors and so on so a lot a rising tide lifts all boats and um i kind of feel like even though the numbers of people on the earth engaging in spiritual pursuits are small they are growing but they're small relatively um they perhaps have an influence um that it you know much greater than their numbers um and maybe one reason for explaining that is that if you can work at a form more fundamental level level you have more leverage you know the molecular level is more powerful than the material the, the gross material and the atomic level is more powerful than the molecular so you know at the level of consciousness itself, the most fundamental level, doing something there could have a much bigger impact than just trying to do stuff on the surface. And that to me has always been a sort of a source of possible optimism. Yes. So in physics um, and systems theory, there, there are insights that have great relevance right now, directly relevant to what you were just speaking about. And it is when a system becomes turbulent, when it loses the coherence of the past, has yet to find its pathway into the future, and the in-between time, when things are unraveling, when things are breaking down, uh, that's a very high potential time for transformation. And small inputs into a system that's in great turbulence, small inputs, the coherence of those small inputs, the resonance of those small inputs can permeate throughout the system and help reconfigure it very rapidly, very quickly. Uh, When in prior years, when it was a system that was really solidified in its, let's say, materialism, consumerism, and so on, it couldn't have that impact. But as we break down, it's a time of freeing up and finding new pathways ahead. Yeah. Um, Maybe you could give some examples. Um, One, a simple analogy that comes to mind is like, you know, jello, when you've made jello and it's all warm and liquidy and all, you can pour it into any shaped mold and it'll take that shape. Uh, But, you know, if it's already molded, then you, then you can't, if it's rigid. Um, so, you know, perhaps turbulence is a, is a malleable condition and, in which things can move in directions they wouldn't be able to if everything was kind of um, stagnant or, or, st- or settled. You think yes. is that, that a good way of suggesting it? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I had, I, I seldom speak about this, but I'm getting old enough now that I, I, I venture out. But in the early 1970s, I had an opportunity uh, at the Stanford uh, Research Institute uh, for a three-year period to be a subject um, in their parapsychology experiments. 
Uh, and there were two kinds of experiments. There, it was receiving, uh, remote viewing, and then sending uh, psychokinesis. And uh, I learned a tremendous amount about the ecology of consciousness in the laboratory. I think very much in keeping with the kinds of things you were just saying earlier. And what I found was that um, if we come to life with a feeling of separation, I'm here and the world's out there and uh, whatever's going to happen, I have to mobilize energy here and push it out there. That doesn't work. Uh, in physics, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so if we start pushing on the world, the world's going to push back. And instead of connection, we get existential separation. However, if we start with the understanding that's now uh, widespread in quantum physics, the universe is a unified whole. That's just the way it is. It's a unified system. And uh, it's not only unified, it's an arising and emergent system. It's a regenerative universe. So as the physicist David Bohm said, the universe is a unified whole in flowing movement. Now, how can we relate to it then? Well, instead of pushing on it, we can go and dance with it. So domination doesn't work, but dancing does. And so uh, given the uh, understanding of the, f of the universe coming now out of physics and out of laboratory experiments like I participated in for three years, we can begin to shift um, our understanding and our intention and our consciousness from one of domination, which is widespread in a materialistic universe, to dancing, which is awakening now in the context of a living uh, universe. So um, I'm wondering, could we play that next video uh, regarding um, a living universe? Have you ever had the experience of seeing a delicate aliveness in the world? Have you ever looked at a flower or the space around you and seen a subtle glow, a luminosity and felt a deep kinship with all of existence? Have you ever experienced a feeling of oneness with the world around you, a feeling of communion with the whole universe? Many people assume that we live in a universe comprised of dead matter and empty space. And this is truly a dark night of the soul if that is the kind of world that we inhabit. Fortunately, ancient wisdom and modern science are coming together and they're revealing the universe in a new way. Instead of dead at the foundation, it is increasingly viewed as a living system in its totality. And certainly at the foundation of all humanity and all of our lives and our life experience is the direct experience of being alive. And it is this experience of profound aliveness that we share with all creatures and all humans. Sometimes I will say to nature, surprise me. And within a few moments, I will see the flight of a bee, the architecture of a flower, there is an astonishing degree of beauty and design in nature's creations. So th this is a, an extraordinary shift from seeing the universe as uh, dead at the foundations and we're separate beings in this uh, flat land of a material universe to recognizing, well, only 5% of the known universe is the material universe that includes our bodies and the stars and planets around us. 95% of the known universe is now recognized as invisible. We can't see it, but it is there. And um, we 
can now begin to open uh, th- with our with our awakening to aliveness that we all carry within ourselves to the ninety five percent of the universe that that goes beyond us. Uh, I had the great privilege of co-authoring a book with Joseph Campbell, as you mentioned, Rick. And in an interview one time, Campbell was asked, well, aren't people seeking meaning in their lives? Isn't that what people want is meaning? And surprisingly, he said, no. He said, what people are looking for is the direct experience of being alive. People want to know, they they want to feel it in their bones and their bodies. This is life and I feel it. And um, and what gives us that experience? Uh, well, uh, being in nature, for example, uh, brings that experience. Connecting with other living beings, whether as as animals or we are pets, uh, flowers, uh, nature around us, it brings that. Relationships, where there's a loving relationship and it, we feel it in our hearts. Making music, uh, that is a direct experience of expressing uh, it can be our aliveness. So there are many ways of encountering the direct experience of being alive, and the importantly, they don't cost much. They're mostly free. And if we need to move from a materialistic universe that's over-consuming the earth to a, a universe that is alive and invites us to grow into that sense of aliveness, that's not going to cost a whole lot. And that's really important in, in enabling us to make this transition to, um, uh, to our greater maturity. Yeah. I mean, my daily routine involves walking in the woods for two hours while listening to things, preparing for that gap <laughs> and, uh, coming home and just you know, doing things at my computer. And you know, it's very simple. Um, not a, I don't need a lot of entertainment and all, because I think part of it is it's not only that what I do is interesting to me, but there's a kind of a baseline of fulfillment that yes. abides regardless of what I do or don't do. Yes. So um, <laughs> Irene says, though, I'm addicted my, to my computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's useful. This is, um, this is uh, something that we all share. Um, people recognize, well, well, of course I'm alive. Well, here I am here. Uh, but are we in touch with how precious that aliveness is and the extent to which in a quantum universe that's unified with itself, when we get in touch with our inner aliveness and and we touch into the uh, aliveness of the universe, a, a light goes on. And that's the light of the light of awakening. Uh, we wake up and say, "Whoa, I'm a part of a larger living system. How do I grow into that larger aliveness?" And so, what's happening now as we make this transition from uh, a dead to a living universe is, first of all, it's changing how we regard the life around us. Secondly, it's changing how we regard ourselves. Uh, we're not only biological beings, we are also a part of the cosmos and its aliveness. So we are inherently biocosmic beings. That's who we already are. We don't have to manufacture that. That's the nature of reality. We are biocosmic beings. Well, then what are we doing here? What kind of journey are we on? Is it to consume more stuff, trying to make ourselves happy? No, the roots way beyond that. What we're learning, what we, the invitation from the universe is we're learning how to live in a living universe. Now that is an infinite journey. That's an extraordinary journey, learning to live in a living universe. And that's what we're being called to do as we wake up and grow up uh, in this new world. Yeah. When you say the universe is alive, as you were saying earlier, you know, I think of, okay, let's take an example of something that appears not to be alive, like a rock. But if you actually look at the rock microscopically enough, you know, you see this marvelous, marvelous crystalline structure, perhaps, and then you see things going on at the chemical level, the molecular level that couldn't be random or, you know, accidental, no way. And that evidence a level of intelligence that's functioning in nature that of which a field of intelligence of which laws of nature arise as impulses which govern the functioning of everything which orchestrate the 
the functioning of everything. So to me, every in that sense, everything seems alive. The sidewalk, you know, the, 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 a tree, uh, and everything. There's, uh, you, you can, if you think about it, there's stuff going on in things that we take for granted that boggles the mind if you actually could fully uh, perceive or appreciate what was happening. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> I like to uh, say that, uh, and this comes out of uh, physics as well, that aliveness is both foundational and emergent. Yes. Uh, so at the foundation of existence, uh, the this universe emerged from a pinpoint about 14 billion years ago, a pinpoint smaller than an atom. It burst into existence and it now has over two trillion galaxies, true trillion galaxies, each galaxy containing a hundred billion or more star systems. So uh, here it is, an extraordinary system has emerged uh, at the foundation. Some life force was there to give it uh, the burst of energy that allowed it to flare forth into existence. And now it continues to grow. And not only is it growing materially, it's growing the fabric of space-time that holds it. This is a miracle uh, how it's uh, developing. So aliveness is both foundational and emergent. So people like you, Rick, and me, uh, we are emergent beings that draw from the larger aliveness of the living uh, universe. So. Um, that when I say we're learning to live in a living universe, that's uh, an extraordinary journey. Now, here, one way of appreciating the depth of this is that science now understands, even though there are two trillion galaxies out there, there's an extraordinary uh, distance between here we are right now to the magnitude of the universe as a whole. But the physicists now say there is more smallness within us than there is bigness beyond us. Uh, the universe is, we think, well, if I just go down to, uh, you know, the level of my skin and such, I'm getting down to the basics of reality. No, there is more smallness within than there is bigness beyond. And, and we, and this is the role of consciousness, wake up. Wake up to the depth, to the scope, the reach, the nature of the aliveness uh, that surrounds us, that gives birth to us, and into which we are growing. Yeah. There's some cool movies that you can watch on YouTube. People could check. Uh, search for Powers of Ten. Yes. And you, you see these. there's several different versions where maybe it starts with somebody lying on a, on a picnic blanket or something, and it starts <laughs> to zoom out, and it just goes out and out and out by Powers of Ten to you know the limits of the universe and then it zooms in again and then it starts to going into the small by powers of 10 deeper and deeper and deeper and as you just said it goes in further uh to in the small direction than it went out in the big direction it's 10 to the larger number in the small yes. direction so we're kind of in the middle uh -huh. yes and you know. uh and in any case um you know things like that I don't know. I have these conversations and debates with friends who don't get this aliveness business or this, you know, everything is is permeated with or swimming in an ocean of intelligence. And I, to me, it seems so obvious. And we go back and forth. It's kind of fun. <laughs> um, but I think it's a real handy way of looking at things. Um, because like we said in the beginning, if you think the universe is dead, then it's natural to exploit it, use it up. Uh, and when we die, who cares? Because we have, we will cease to exist. And uh, good right. good luck with the coming generations. But you know, if you see it as live, then you know anything you do to it, you're doing to a living being, and you are intimately connected with that living being. So you're doing it to yourself. That's right. Uh, you said, well, we're sort of in the middle ground, and indeed we are. Physics says that uh, we're a little bit more than halfway up that ruler from the very large to the very small and in fact we're giants in the cosmic scale of things so um this is fascinating we're being transformed now by our own science and our own uh, knowledge um so i would like to uh i'd like to 
go to another dimension of uh, uplift that's happening uh, right now. There are many things. There's the uplift of uh, consciousness, the uplift of, of reconciliation movements that are happening around the world. But a third area of uplift is what's happening for you and I right now, and it's using the tools of communication uh, to connect ourselves uh, with one another in ways that have never been possible before. And because we're going to be talking about the internet and stuff, right? The internet, yes. Okay. Before we launch into that, I just want to throw in a okay, a, yes, please quote, quote from the Kato Upanishad. Um, Brahman or the totality is described as Anoranian Mahato Mahian, which means it's it's smaller than the smallest and bigger than the biggest. And and that doesn't mean that it's really really small or really really big. It means it, it transcends spatial dimensions altogether. But it's that it's said to be that which contains the whole universe, like a drop in an ocean. Yes. And and then the, the Upanishad keeps coming back to and that thou art. That's what we are. So when we refer, refer to ourselves as being somewhere in the middle, size wise, we're referring to our bodies, but we're not our bodies. We are we are Brahman. We are the totality living through a body and, yes. and the mosquito is the totality living through a mosquito body and so on and so forth but we can get to a stage in our development where we identify predominantly as that totality and secondarily as a limited being and then we we're, we're sort of a walking breathing universe Anyway, Absolutely. Got that out. <laughs> well said. Well said, Rick. Thank you. Um, All right. You wanted to get into the communications thing. Yeah. Um, people say, well, okay, uh, you know, the aliveness and in my experience, about half the people I encounter say, well, of course it's alive. Uh, how could it be otherwise? Look at the beauty and the, the, the architecture of creation and so on. And uh, I can be in a circle of five or ten people and not say anything and then pretty soon someone's going to chime in and say well it's you're crazy if you think this is alive uh of course there show me you know it's just dead matter and empty space and and the conversation uh is is so juicy so generative because people that see and experience and know the aliveness they go for the walks in nature they take time to meditate and so on it's in your bones. We're, we are that aliveness, as you say so clearly, uh, Rick. So we're in a process now of making that transition from, well, you're crazy if you think it's alive to, no, you're crazy uh, if you think it's not, if you think it's dead. So this is a wonderful time, I think, a generative time uh, to be alive. Yeah. And there's a number of things we're, we're going to still get into here, but you, you were starting to suggest, you know, the internet. We wouldn't be doing this right now, you and I, without the internet. That's um, right. So the, the internet is sort of a, a global nervous system of sorts. And, um, you know, there are other ways in which we're all connected, but this is one in which we can be connected visually and audibly and, and so on. And it's obviously democratizing knowledge and information. It's also uh, enabling the spread of a great deal of confusion and misinformation. Yes. And that perhaps that perhaps um, fits into your three themes that you outlined in, in that video. You know, the, the, the internet can be used for authoritarianism, it can be used for to, to sow chaos, or it can be used to infuse, you know, greater wisdom into the world. And, um, yeah, I guess it depends on what we choose to put our attention on and, and to generate or create. That's right. Uh, the, the tools of uh, communication are neutral. It, they can be used in each of those three ways you just uh, described so well. Um, and part of my work uh, over decades now has been to look at uh, both television and the Internet uh, and how that is transforming. Uh, how we relate to uh, one another and the world. And um, I'd like to just speak about uh, for a minute here about uh, the Internet, uh, because it's, it's an area that I'm working with right now. And um, people say, well, how can we come together as a human family? How can we find one another as a human species and come to a new consensus, a new consciousness? And, and I say, well, uh, there, we have the technologies, the tools that will help us uh, achieve that. And um, 
and I speak about the Internet, uh, but um, I want to quote something uh, from uh, Dog Hammarskjöld, who in the 1950s was a, um, one of the main secretary generals of the United Nations. And he was asked, he said... I think he uh, was about, there when Khrushchev pounded his shoe on the table, wasn't he? I, I, I think, <laughs> he, yes, he well could have been. I remember that. Um, he he was asked about the uh, United Nations. And, well, why hasn't it done more? You know, it just creates confusion and the kinds of issues that we just spoke about here. And he said uh, the function of, of the United Nations, as he saw it, was not to take humanity to heaven, but to save humanity from hell of our own making. And here we are. We're in that situation right now. I'm not saying the Internet is going to take us to a new heaven, but it could well save us from going to a hell of our own making. And, uh, well, how could you do that? And I, I pick up a, a cell phone and I say to people, look, two-thirds of the people on this planet have one of these in their hands. Two-thirds. By the end of this dec decade, it will be three-quarters of the people on the planet have one of these. And I say, you hold the future in your hands because as soon as you open up a browser, as soon as you open up uh, access to, um, let's say, a program like this, you're opening up to the World Wide Web, as it was originally called, the World Wide Web and the potential connect with people around the planet. Now, Rick, you and I both know that China has its firewalls to keep people out uh, or keep a lot of people in. Uh, so does Russia. But more broadly, uh, the Internet connects with people around the earth right now. And so if we would simply mobilize those tools of technology, we can begin to achieve a new level of communication and consciousness. We're not separate beings isolated by geography anymore uh, or isolated necessarily by a society like uh, dictatorships and so on. Those are leaky systems. And uh, we can come together as a species and find a new consciousness and a new consensus about where we're going to go from here. Uh, can we find reconciliation and um, a sense of unity in our, our collective journey that takes us into this extraordinary possibility that, well, we're living beings and we're learning to live in a living universe. What an amazing invitation uh, for evolution that is surrounding us. And we have the tools right now. Uh, if we will use these, and that's something I'm exploring, uh, we, if we use these tools, we can begin to come together as a human community. And we may not reach a uh, heaven, but we can avoid the hell that's under, that's developing uh, right now. So uh, this is a very practical uh, way of moving and integrating the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of uh, uh, the very practical dimensions that we know in our everyday lives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm doing, I guess, with BatGap. I'm using the Internet to you are. Do, do this. And, you, are. you know, I, I, when I was a snarky teenager, I used to sometimes <laughs> say, well, uh, freedom of the press belongs to those who own one. But you know, now everybody <laughs> more or less owns one, or if they yeah, want to. Yeah, we own one. <laughs> yes, and um, you're doing it. Yeah, but as you say, it's a mixed blessing because anybody can put out anything. I mean, there's been so much disinformation spreading around, and <clears throat> there was a big study recently by Harvard, Brown, Microsoft, and Brigham and Women's Hospital that showed that um, about 319,000 Americans died. Who wouldn't have if all eligible people had gotten the COVID vaccine? But there was a lot of misinformation spreading about, it, which you know dissuaded them from doing so. So that has obviously um, lethal consequences. And you know, then there's all these issues about well, should Twitter you know shut down somebody's account for saying saying things that might harm people, or should Facebook censor posts and and all? And, and do they have the right to do that? I mean, these are issues that we're grappling with, I think, as we learn how to use this tool. 
and you know have it be not so much a mixed blessing well um we hold the future in our hands so right now it's corporate america that's telling us how to use the tool and and what i'm suggesting is that we can become empowered in ways we hadn't imagined until recently if we come together as a species that's a new superpower for the future and the i in my estimation the next great superpower will not be china or a collecting collection of nations the next great superpower will be us as ordinary individuals around the earth that come together and use the internet uh in particular as a tool of collective communication and consciousness and we begin we begin to speak the future that we want together yeah so we're on the verge of that or at least I guess you're referring to people who were saying the things that you and I are trying to say today, because as a species, we say many things and we are, we are of many minds. And here, here just yes. in the United States alone, there's tremendous polarization and yes. conflict over so many different issues. So maybe it's sort of may the best man win kind of a scenario. Um, <laughs> you know, like you said, with your arrows, you know, it could go this way or it could go that way. And that's and right. So, um, and the very tool that we're using to have this conversation could be used to impose greater authoritarianism or yes. um, or the tool could become completely inoperable if enough chaos takes place all the various servers could start breaking down due to electrical outages and and things and then we then we'll really be out of touch with one another yes that's right um the internet was des designed, uh, as you know, to, uh, in the case of nuclear war, there would be workarounds. So even if one area was, was shattered and in ruins, there would be ways to get workarounds so we still could communicate with one another. And that is really a part of my hope, is that there are workarounds to allow us to come together as a human family. And what will prevail will be the consciousness, the compassion, uh, the aliveness, the sense of possibility that we're working for as a um, as a species hmm. there's a vedic saying which is kind of encouraging it which is that um that which is closest to truth lasts longest um so if that's true you know then uh, what was it martin luther king said that the, the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice yes you know so sometimes in dire predicaments we we may feel that all hope is lost and that um you know we're all going to hell in a handbasket but if quotes like that are hold merit then you know in the big picture in the long run things are going to work out that's right so uh i feel we're going to make we can do this that's the key thing that i say to people that say there's we're doomed uh there are global surveys that have been done and they found that of uh, young people 18 to 25 56 percent say we are doomed as a species they've given up and i'm i'm saying don't give up uh it's it, we're, we're just getting uh, started moving into our early adulthood as a human family so it's time to step up uh and and move ahead use these tools of transformation D work into the heartfelt aliveness that we each carry into the world bring that into the world as a transforming uh capacity so if we mobilize these capacities both invisible and visible we have a future uh, an extraordinary future ahead of us yeah um Here's a quote from your book from Martin Luther King uh, Jr. He said that um, to realize justice in human affairs, injustice must be exposed with all of the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. Yes. So a lot of times when, you know, various scandals break or, you know, corruption is exposed and things like that, you know, it's it's a good thing um i think go, go ahead and comment on that i'm yes. really groaning over here because i'm talking so much <laughs> i'm enjoying the conversation we have to tell the truth the first thing we have to do if we're going to be uh, in a transformational process we have to tell the truth about what's going on 
And uh, there's a lot of, of uh, distortion and lies about the nature of what is happening. But nonetheless, we have to keep telling the truth, telling the truth. And with that, we can come to a new level of understanding and acceptance. And with the acceptance comes the potential for reconciliation. Uh, the rich, the poor, uh, the gender reconciliation, uh, reconciliation across, across race and ethnicity, geography, and so on. Uh, future generations versus current generations. I mean, look at Greta Thunberg. She is saying, you're consuming it all right now. You're not going to leave anything for uh, the younger generation. So uh, th we have to bring these issues into the healing light of public awareness before they can be uh, accepted and then transformed. And then we can move on uh, into our early adulthood as a, as a human family. Yeah, I remember, uh, who was it? Chuck Todd was talking to um, Kellyanne Conway, and he said something about, well, these are the facts of the matter. And she said, well, here's some alternative facts. And he, he said, wait a minute, alternative facts? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, you know, when you say tell the truth, obviously people have different views on what that is. Yeah. But there's another Vedic, science, Vedic quote, which is nice here, which is that satyame vajayate, which means truth alone is victorious. And again, it's one of those eventually kind of things, but <laughs> hopefully in the end, yes. you know, <laughs> Frodo wins the day. Yes. This has been a delightful conversation. I've appreciated your uh, the wisdom you're bringing into this uh, and from your life experience. So this is this is really a pleasure uh, to talk with you. Good, and we have more to go through too, if if you have time, um, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, when when terrible things happen, like let's say Russia in, invades Ukraine, and now and we know how rough that's been, and now we're going to see famines because the wheat supply has been shut down, and that, that was thirty percent of the world's wheat right there. Um, that's obviously some of the turbulence that you illustrated in your diagram. Um, do you see a silver lining somehow? Do you feel like okay, we're going through this 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 difficulty, but somehow? in going through this, we're going to wise up and things will be better. Maybe, maybe Putin will, you know, disappear and Russia will become a more enlightened place and we'll all get along and that kind of thing. I don't know. Well, um, I think we're going to go through a, an absolutely devastating time, uh, in the decades ahead. I, I really do. Um, Right now, we have uh, nearly 8 billion people on the Earth, and scientists estimate the carrying capacity of the Earth is roughly 2 billion people living in middle-class European lifestyles, 2 billion people. Explain what carrying yeah. capacity means. The carrying capacity means that the regenerative uh, ability of the, the land and the oceans the, to year by year, uh, can grow the food, grow, uh, have the fish, uh, and so on. It can support roughly two billion people. When did we uh, last have two billion people on the planet? Well, when I when I was born, there was just a little over two billion people. So, in the space of one lifetime, we have gone from roughly two billion, and we're approaching eight billion. The estimates are by the end of the of the century, we're going to be approaching ten billion people. And so, we've so, been draining our bank account, our resource bank account, for the right. last we've over half a century. Yeah. Well said. We're draining the bank account. They we're overdrawing on what the what the uh, generative capacity of the Earth can create. So, if you think about that, uh, I just cannot imagine the possibility that something like six, seven, eight billion people might die off in this century. How can that be? Well, famine and disease, we're seeing pandemics now beginning to grow. And as, as the world heats up, as the uh, global warming continues, it's releasing new toxins, new, new uh, viruses into the uh, atmosphere and so on. And I think we're going to have just a plague of pandemics. We're going to have extraordinary amount of disease and extraordinary amount of famine. Uh, every degree centigrade that uh, the earth heats up, 
15% lower productivity of the land. And if we go up by 3 degrees centigrade, that's a 45% degree d decrease in the productivity of agriculture on the earth. We can't feed ourselves hardly right now. What happens if there's an enormous cutback in productivity at the same time? There's still a growing increase in the number of people. We're in for an extraordinary time of correction, if you will, uh, where we as a species match the resources of the earth and its regenerative uh, capacity. So, uh, we, you know, and so then what? And what happens if sea levels rise a couple of feet and all the world's <laughs> coastal cities have to be evacuated and you have hundreds of millions of people trying to go somewhere and That's right. in the middle of droughts and famines? That's right. Uh, there's roughly 3 billion people that live around the equatorial regions of the, of the planet. And those equatorial regions are going to become increasingly uninhabitable. uninhabitable. In Pakistan, there are temperatures regu regularly reaching 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 120 degrees. Now that's at the very, very margins of what people can tolerate. New, De New Delhi has been like that in recent months. Yes. Yeah. So we're already approaching portions of the earth becoming uninhabitable and then people are going to start migrating to the more resource favored and, and climate favored portions of the earth. Now, it only took a million people to destabilize uh, Europe. Uh, the movement of a million people into Europe it, it was has been profoundly destabilizing of the civic structures and so on. What happens when there's not one million but three billion people moving north and south to more resource and climate favored regions. That's what you're talking about. And that's what we're going to be, we're going to start experiencing that very, very soon. Uh, it's already underway as a trickle, it's going to turn into a rush. But then you ask, well, uh, well, people say, well, look, we're doomed. Uh, well, no, uh, we need to look at how we learn. And trauma is our teacher. Uh, the the sorrow, the grief, uh, the loss of these years, that's our teacher. We're doing this to ourselves. Uh, no one came and imposed this upon us, but rather we have created these conditions ourselves, and we have the capacity, I feel, to unravel uh, these circumstances and move into a more habitable uh, relationship with the earth and with the uh, well-being of all life. Mm. Let's think of some traumas and what we've learned from them. I mean, we have, let's say, the Civil War, World War I, um, the Great Depression, World War II. Um, did we learn? <laughs> I mean, maybe we did. I mean, obviously, the racial situation is much better today than it was prior to the Civil War. Um, we, we, and then we had World War II. Now we get along with Germany and Japan. Um, but then we have a whole lot of nuclear weapons we didn't have before. And That's right. Fortunately, those haven't. So I'm just wondering to what, how many steps forward are we taking for every few steps backward? You bet. That's right. Um, well, various things. Uh, think about this gender equality. Uh, we have awakened to the role of women on the earth. And person, researcher after researcher is saying, if we want a habitable earth, we need to empower women. They need to be given the opportunity of education and, and participation in the affairs uh, of the world and life. And that is beginning to happen, a transformation that's been really thousands of years in the making is now happening in this generation. Uh, so there's an immense transformation uh, and learning that has been underway. The same is well, Black Lives Matter, for example. Uh, we're beginning to take seriously that, that the white population, the, the men like ourselves, white men are not, are going to be in a minority soon. And we need to, to accept and, and work with the reality um, of racial diversity, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, and so on. And we're beginning to do that. So it isn't a done deal. And as, uh, as Hammarskjöld uh, said about the United Nations, he was not expecting to create a heaven on earth, but to avoid 
creating a hell on earth. And if we can do that, if we can work our way through this time of extraordinary challenge and difficulty and see it as a maturing experience for the whole human family, I think we have a promising future ahead of us. Yeah, and I guess we're sort of doing it. I mean, it's always by fits and starts, and there are always people digging their heels in and resisting every little bit of change. Um, sure. But, but, you know, somehow or other, we do seem to be progressing. Uh, I'm not real familiar with the work of Steven Pinker, but I've, some, I've often heard him quoted as itemizing all these really good things that we've got going for us now that we didn't in the past you know so i mean it, it can it can seem pretty depressing and dire when you re watch the news and stuff but many things are better that's right it's a it's a it's an open system uh it's there's potential here there's possibility and um a lot of people, like I just mentioned, the 56% of youth on the planet saying we're doomed. Well, here, well, let's open this up and move beyond the materialism, materialism and consumerism of Western society and see the world freshly with new eyes and recognize that if we're learning to live in a living universe, that's an entirely new and different journey that we have been on in the past. So we... It, if we're going to be successful, we need to reframe, I think, how we understand what we're doing here and where we are, what, who we are as biocosmic beings and where we're going. We're learning to live in a living universe. One thing I liked about your book is that as you went through the coming decades and um, sketched out what might possibly happen <laughs> in these de decades, you know, on the one hand, there was uh, this, you know, collapse and and breakdown taking place and all the dire details of that. But at the, the same time, you'd weave into those chapters good things that would be happening as people kind of woke up more and more and hopefully counterbalanced That's right. know, the yellow arrows from, from your diagram. Uh, um, and you have a whole section in your book about seven uplifting forces. And at, yes. some, at some point in our conversation, perhaps we should go through those um to uh you know break the the bummer mood that we might be creating here <laughs> <laughs> well this is this is it i mean this is, let's get serious here uh how challenging and how critical our situation is it's not a time for complacency it's a time to step up and and be in the in the in the transformational process itself and it's hard to do without seeing the uplift potential that surrounds us and um those uplift uh, factors, uh, by the way, let me just mention uh, the book Choosing Earth uh, is available online uh, for free. And our situation is so dire, I've, I've said, look, I'll just make this available for free as a PDF, something that everyone can uh, print out for themselves. If they I'll make want. sure to link to that on your Batcat page. Yeah, yeah. good, I'll, I'll do that. So the, um, you, you mentioned the, what are these uplifting factors for heaven's sakes? Well, we've already spoken about a number of them. Uh, first of all, uh, aliveness, recognizing that what we're seeking is the direct experience of being alive and that is uh, uh, something that's free. Uh, it's already present, it's already there and available to us. Uh, and before you skim through them, I wanna comment okay. on some of them. Oh, like for, inst for instance, <laughs> aliveness, one thing I always experienced with my meditation practice was from the time I learned it was that I felt like after each, I felt like as I was doing it, I was being infused with more aliveness. Yes. And, and um, I could just feel my brain waking up and my body yes. kind of being refreshed and regenerated. And then when I would come back into activity, I, I felt like I had greater resources with which to infuse more of that aliveness into my life or into my environment. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, to use a simple analogy, if you wanted to go shopping and you didn't have any money in your pockets, you wouldn't be very productive. But if you go to the bank first and withdraw some resources, then you can shop. So I felt like I was dipping into my inner resources and then being more successful in, in the marketplace of life. Yes. 
Golly, that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, so there's one. I mean, it's it's all around us. It's within us, and it's available to us. And uh, we need to recognize that. And and as you say, uh, just bring it in, bring it down, bring it through. Yeah. So and, and um, we all do have. And I'm just talking about myself here. We we all do have an unlimited reservoir of potential deep within, and we all have the capacity to tap into it. We just have to find out how that's right that's right we have to find out how we have to recognize it's there and then begin our exploration and discovery uh, and that's a that's an inside job we're each called to do for ourselves and for the world yeah i mean if you think about the forest for instance like let's say the amazon rainforest um it's green and verdant by virtue of the fact that all the plants are rooted in this very fertile soil and they get plenty of rain and stuff so it's not and if it were looking not so green it wouldn't help to spray paint it green or anything it had we'd have to improve the, its ability to draw nourishment each each individual plant's ability to draw nourishment from its through its roots yes. and so like that you know all as many of us as possible on this earth as many humans as possible need to learn how to draw forth that inner nourishment and that's right. then the whole forest of humanity will look more green. That's right. Use the analogy. That's right. Yeah. So um, other uplift factors, um, mentioning just a few, uh, the next one uh, up on my list is uh, consciousness. And we've been speaking about consciousness throughout. Um, and th there's thinking consciousness where we think that who we are is what we think and we've been living in thinking consciousness for a long while and you and i are now talking about a reflective consciousness where we're, we have the ability to look back and see ourselves and one of the key uh understandings i like to share with people is who our name as a species uh, we think we're homo sapiens actually the technical name of who we are is homo sapiens sapiens now to be sapient means to be wise or knowing and to be homo sapiens sapiens means to be doubly wise or doubly knowing not only to know that we're here but know that we know and um uh, American Indians, they have three miracles that they often uh, speak about, or they do speak about. Uh, the first miracle is that there's anything here at all. And we've, we've talked about this, the living universe. The first miracle is, the, is that the universe is here at all. The second miracle is that there are living things here, uh, plants and animals, uh, and we can see the life around us. You were just speaking about that. The third miracle is uh, the recognition that we know we are here not only we see we're here but we know that we know that we're here and knowing that we know is anchoring it brings that capacity for uh, recognition and therefore action within us so um, that's an extraordinary capacity and it moves beyond just a reflective consciousness into a more compassionate engagement with life where our life we feel it in the context of meeting others and that's a compassionate consciousness so consciousness evolves as we evolve in our understanding of of that and i'm sure i'm sure rick as a teacher of consciousness you have things you want to add right here well, as you were saying that, I was thinking of what <laughs> Jesus said on the cross. Um, Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. So the guys who were nailing him on the cross, he could see that they weren't really conscious of right. the implications of what they were doing. And you could perhaps extend that out to um, Vladimir Putin or J Bolsonaro burning down the rainforest or, you know, people doing these, these horrible, destructive, short-sighted things they are just shut down in their consciousness they are operating out of such a limited perspective um they don't know what they're doing and i remember europe offered bolsonaro a whole lot of money to stop burning down the rainforest and and he said man eh, plant more trees in your own continent you know we're just going to mind our own business here so there's a stupidity a, a numbness a, an ignorance right. that prevails so often 
So that consciousness is critical. It's critical to move beyond the thinking consciousness uh, into the reflective consciousness that says, well, let me look at this freshly, recognizing I'm a part of a larger system of aliveness. And that's transformative. And you're speaking about that so directly. Yeah. So, ch mentioning uh, other... Um, Choosing communication. Up uplifting factor. So we saw the power of, of aliveness, the power of consciousness. The third one is the, uh, is the power of communication. Um, and it's phenomenal. I, I feel that uh, if we look at human evolution, it was our ability to communicate that got us from awakening hunter-gatherers roughly 10,000 years ago uh, at the end of the last ice age to the verge of a planetary civilization today. We communicate, 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 and at each stage uh, we have grown, we've expanded uh, the sphere of connection with, uh, with the rest of life, with one another, and here we are at the edge of a planetary civilization. We're not really there yet. Um, but we have the tools of communication that uh, the internet uh, and such um, that can take us over and into uh, our understanding that we are here uh, together and we can communicate together and we can choose together our pathway into the future. And that's why it is choosing Earth. We can do this. We can choose the Earth as our home. And uh, so there's the third uh, great uplifting uh, factor. Uh, the, and on that one, obviously, yeah. it's more than just the technological means to communicate. We've, we've got that pretty good shape now, but it's having the somehow the wisdom to be able to understand and, and connect with each other. Um, and the you know, have you ever noticed, my wife and I often talk about this, you're talking to somebody, maybe a, even a friend, and they're, they're going on and on and on and on and about themselves. And, um, and then finally, you know, you try to say something about what's going on in your life. And they say, well, it's getting late, got to go. Um, <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. like that old saying, you know, me, me, me. Okay, enough about me. What do you think about me? Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, somehow we have to some somehow be more interested in each other and more kind of interested in understanding what makes the other person tick. You know, what, what's their perspective? Okay, let's say I have certain feelings about gun control. Okay, why do people who feel so differently than I feel the way they do? And is there some kind of bridge that we could meet at um, to actually communicate about the issue? And there are some kind of interesting organizations and movements attempting to do just that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, there's this black guy who has actually made a career of collecting Ku Klux Klan robes by befriending the people and then kind of communicating with them human to human and getting convincing them to leave the Ku Klux Klan. That's just one example, but well, we need more of that. Yes. Well, um, curiosity and consciousness go together in my, in my estimation. If you're really awake to the world, it becomes a magical place. It's an interesting place. Uh, it isn't all figured out. No, it's just alive. It's happening. It's real. And then curiosity. Well, who are you that you are here doing what you and how is that happening? Let's look at the architecture of this living system, the universe that we inhabit. So curiosity is a key part of that. And um, so thanks for bringing that. Yeah. yeah. And perhaps that rests upon the first two points, awareness or aliveness and uh, and consciousness. You know, if you're more alive, more conscious, then you have that greater curiosity. You're, That's right. And more passion about being communicative and so on. That's right. Yeah. All right. So then the next one uh, on the list here um, is maturity. We've been talking about maturity. We have to grow up as a species, uh, move beyond our adolescent uh, behaviors and, and mindset and into... Um, uh, well, with maturity, one thing I, I love to uh, acknowledge uh, with maturity is freedom. There are certainly responsibilities when you become an adult, if you will, uh, work responsibilities, family responsibilities, and so on. But there is freedom. 
as an adult that is not present when we're adolescents. And adolescents are pushing on the edges, give me the freedom, giving me the freedom, but I, there has to be balance with responsibilities as well. And, uh, but we are moving into a world of um, new freedoms um, that we have yet to really begin to explore. So um, that's a part of maturation that I really um, I appreciate. Yeah, and freedom requires maturity because if, you, if you're not mature and you have too much freedom, then you end up creating all kinds of harm, and, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're looking at yeah, like 18 year olds who are free to buy AR AR 14s or whatever they call those guys. AR 15, 15s, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and and you try to you know change something about that. And, well, you're you're challenging our freedoms. That's right. Um, yeah. How about uh, God, you could get me going on that topic, but <laughs> uh, I mean, there's also a little thing in the Bill of Rights about the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How about those freedoms? Um, it's a little bit hard to exercise those if you're if you've been shot. I would yes. Say. Yeah. <sighs> All right. And then the next <laughs> one, Rick. Let's kind of, in. <laughs> we'll work into this. The next one, <laughs> uplifting factor uh, is beyond maturity is reconciliation. To have the maturity uh, to see the integrity of life and the um, the right to life uh, that is, surrounds us, that uh, not only other people have the right uh, to their life uh, that transcends ethnicity and race, gender, income, and so on. We all have this aliveness within us and reconciling ourselves to living in a, in a world filled with different expressions of aliveness, not only human aliveness, but the aliveness of plants and animals and, and, and the whole cosmic system. Uh, that's an extraordinary uh, challenge, but it's an extraordinary opportunity for uplift to take us into a new future of possibility. Yeah, there's another nice Vedic saying in that one. It's uh, Vasudev to Kumbhakam, I think it's pronounced, which is the world is my family. Yeah. Um, and, you know, very, I think very few people view the world as their family. Um, but we're all, you know, to quote Buck, Mr. Fuller, we're all passengers on spaceship Earth. And yeah. we've, we've got to reconcile um, in order not to, uh, you know, yes. destroy the, spa the only spaceship we have. That's right. I saw him speak, incidentally, back in uh, about 1971. It was a great opportunity. And it, let's let's hit a little bit more on reconciliation. Because okay, with, yeah. with, with climate change in particular, uh, aside from all the other problems that we can consider, um, there is no agreement that it even exists in the U.S. Congress. Uh, about half the half the politicians there won't admit that it does or that it's a serious problem. So how? It, I mean, if you were, let's say, a cons, what what would you call it, a, a counselor, a, a consultant to um, to Washington, which I guess you have been in certain yeah, times of your I life, uh, how would you attempt to achieve some kind of real reconciliation so we could get everybody on board with that particular issue, for instance? Well, well, um, I worked on a presidential commission in the early 1970s. It was on uh, population growth and the American future. And it was looking not only at the growth, uh, but also then the urbanization uh, of um, American society over the next 30 years. And while on that commission, I wrote a paper as a uh, staff member uh, for the commission members, and it was titled The Poverty of Our Abundance. And it was, the idea was, what are we doing with the wealth that we have over the next three decades? Uh, can we re-envision how to use our abundance in more creative and compassionate ways? And um, I thought this was a <laughs> great idea, uh, but... Uh, the uh, senior uh, leaders of, of the commission felt otherwise, and they wanted to fire me. And uh, But they couldn't, given uh, government laws, and they just pushed me aside, basically uh, kept me out of the uh, deliberative process. Now, I learned some things there. You don't push on a system like that. 
Um, what we can do, though, is recontextualize it. And that's where the power of communication comes in. And it's happening right now uh, where people uh, say, well, you, a third may say, well, it's, it's hoax to think that it's a big uh, hoax to think that there's anything like climate change. And the other two-thirds says, you're wrong. This is an, an extremely important and identifiable and research possibility. And so the context, the political context changes. So my approach is to say, work at the periphery. Create a new context of understanding. Uh, that is something that we can do. Whereas if you go right into the, into the heart of the beast, into the political process itself, that's really pushing against something that's going to push back politically and it's going to be hard to get traction. So um, th that takes us then back to communication. Can we communicate our way into a transforming future, creating a new context of understanding and, and consensus that will then permeate uh, the political apparatus and give us a new pathway ahead? Mm. Upton, <coughs> Upton Sinclair said, you, you can't get a man to understand something if his salary depends upon his not understanding it. That's and right. and I, th right. I think that applies to politicians who, whose cash flow, which they have to spend a good portion of their time trying to raise, depends upon um, agreeing with the fossil fuel industry or yes. early, earlier on, it was the tobacco industry and so on. Yes. Yeah. No, no, that's that's I have experienced that directly, very, very directly. Um, but I think in their heart of hearts, they do understand it. That, I, I, I'm a little cynical in that regard. And they're just corrupt enough to talk the talk that they need to talk, even though they realize they're lying. Yeah. the uh, I had the opportunity to um, do a study for the president's science advisor. Uh, this is in the mid-1970s. And they asked us... Uh, we want a fresh view of the future. Uh, don't tell us what we already know. We know we have population problems, even energy problems and so on. Tell us what we don't know. Uh, what is going to happen in the future that could wipe us out from the blind side? <laughs> and um, a number of things were, were offered up to the uh, President's Science Advisor in this year-long study. And uh, among them was climate change. And, uh, and uh, bless their hearts, they said, uh, well, uh, we, just, we, we see this is happening, of course, uh, but it's going to be 40 or so years, maybe even 50 years before it's going to have a major impact. So that's so far into the future, we don't have to worry about it now. Okay, now, 40 years after the mid-1970s is now. Here we are. It's, it's finally happened. And I've been watching decade by decade uh, just want to see these things happening and that, that are beginning to wipe us out from the blind side because we weren't paying attention. And the political apparatus is so focused on a short-term political agenda, it's not stepping back to look at the world as a whole system and to pay attention at that scale. So we're seeing the consequences of a lack of consciousness and a lack of courage to take what we already see and stick with it. Not only like the American Indians, seven generations into the future, pay attention, seven generations ahead. Well, this is pay attention one generation ahead and, and we weren't doing it. And now we're experiencing the consequences of that lack of conscious uh, attention. So this is, we're, I'm hopeful, hopeful that we're learning here, Rick. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm hopeful. Patanjali has a phrase in the Yoga Sutras, which is avert the danger, which has not yet come. And, uh, you know, 40 years ago, it's it's like changing the course of a river. You know, if you wait till the river gets to the to the mouth, you know, to the ocean, it's too late to do anything about the, the course of it. But if you can go back to the very source of the river, you know, perhaps some little thing could change it off in a different direction. Of course, this That's is right. just an analogy, and it probably wouldn't work that way. But no, no, it's, uh, no, that is how it works. Yeah, 
that is how it works. So uh, we need to make these what seemingly small course corrections right now, uh, like f the food that we eat, uh, shift towards a, a more vegetarian diet, uh, the clothes that we wear. Um, I've been wearing the same shirt for a decade or more now. I hope uh, you've been washing it. Uh, it, it <laughs> <laughs> it's time. It's time for a wash. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to waste water, but <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Got to be careful here. Not too often. Uh, the transportation we use. I gave up my car, uh, and so on. It, it's all up for grabs. And if we, the car, the food, the the the, the clothing, and so on, if we make these small changes, they add up. And if we're all doing that together, uh, the, what what's small little rivers become a huge ocean of uh, transformation, and so that's what I'm I'm hopeful for. Yeah, but now unfortunately the changes have to be much more radical because we've waited so long. That's right. Um, I just watched this whole Frontline documentary about um, the three part thing, and it was all about how Exxon had this research group in the 1970s, and they the, the research group said, "Well, climate change is coming; it could be catastrophic. We've got to do something." So they started thinking about alternative energies and and all. And then then some executives came in and just shut that down, got rid of that research group, and yes. began spending millions of dollars to to create obfuscation and doubt about that's about right climate change instead of actually doing something. That's right. Um, and uh, you know now we're in in the pickle that we're in. That's right, and not just Exxon, but Shell and other major. All yeah, they all were were obfuscating yeah. and distorting, and and now we're paying the price of uh, the need for radical change in in this decade. This Some people say they should be held accountable the way the tobacco companies have been yes. for billions of dollars. Although you know the tobacco companies couldn't bring back all the people who died. And I don't think that the oil companies could eliminate all the damage that's happened. But right. that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. No, no, Rick. This is we're this is the uplift section we're working. Oh on. yes, uplift, uplift. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Need to take okay. a happy pill. <laughs> okay. The next one, if you're ready for it, is okay. commu community. Community. Um, we're living in such fragmented, separate, isolated ways. So many people have their, their apartment, their house, and it's, they're living alone. They're not connected with their neighbors and so on. I'm living right now, my wife and I are living in a, in a co-housing community here in California. And that's a community of it's 60 people, roughly. 30 units, 60 people, and uh, we, ha we have common meals, typically two or three days a week, we eat together. Uh, we work on the landscaping together. We have a garden that grows a lot of the food that we use. Uh, we have a woodworking uh, shop. Uh, we have a common house where we can gather together. We have a place for kids to play, and so on. And so it's, a, it's an integrated eco-village uh, kind of setting. And um, what we're learning is our insights that could be transported to the world at large. The whole world could be an eco-village. The whole thing could be an eco-village. And uh, where we have uh, all of these small um, gatherings of, of people and properties, and, and they have a high degree of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. So there's resilience at the local level, but then it grows out and builds out to the uh, more regional and then global scale. So community, new kinds of community are critical, I feel, to our future. And if you went to the Bioneers Conference, for instance, um, you'd see that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of organizations and initiatives and things that are going on that don't make the news. And it, it's okay. kind of inspiring to see all that. So there, there are things happening all over the world. That's right. Um, there are invisible revolutions underway, as you suggest, all around the world. And we have yet to uplift those into our collective consciousness so we can choose effectively new pathways ahead. Yeah. You know, earlier we were talking about phase transitions um, and how they are opportunities for change because everything is in flux. And um, one thing about phase transitions is that often you don't see them coming. Um, like even the simple example is the boiling of water. It can be 
99 degrees Celsius and it doesn't look like anything much is happening and one more degree and it's boiling. Yes. So, so we never know how close we might be as a, as a society to certain abrupt changes. Great example. Yeah. I think we're getting close, Rick. I've been <clears throat> watching this develop, as I said, for about a half century. And um, boy, it, at a feeling level, there's a thinking level. I've done tremendous amounts of research. But as I speak with people uh, around uh, the community here uh, and really through the Internet now around the planet, uh, I just seeing the agitation and the concern, the stress, the awareness that's awakening, I think we're approaching that place of uh, collect the collective boiling point uh, into a, a new configuration or the possibility of a new configuration uh, for humanity. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, look what's just been happening in the last, I mean, COVID was a big upset and um, yeah talk about choosing simplicity it was it was imposed on a lot of people um and they all went nuts you know wanting to have their movies and their travel and their restaurants and all the stuff that people are used to um but um now we're i mean supply chains are breaking down and uh, i don't know if they can be gotten back together properly um no. Jamie Dimon and Elon Musk both said within the last few days that we're on the brink of some kind of economic hurricane. Hurricane, yes. Um, so there seems to be something coming. I think uh, what I've suggested in the scenarios uh, that I presented earlier is that we're in a time of unraveling now. Things are breaking down, they're coming apart. Uh, and if things unravel enough, they come apart enough, well, then there's not enough to hold the whole thing together. And if it can't hold, it falls. And if we are in tremendous overshoot, uh, far beyond what the, the carrying capacity of the earth, it won't be just a small uh, decline. It will be a great fall. I feel that's what's coming for us. Probably yeah, by the decade of the uh, 2030s, maybe sooner. Uh, but we're going to go from a time of unraveling to a time of severe breakdown, a great fall, and then the deep collapse of uh, civilization on the earth. And it's that's um, predictable, I, I feel, and uh, we can anticipate that and work with that and move through that. And um, that brings us really in some ways to this last uplifting factor, which is simplicity, simplicity of living. And we already spoke about uh, aliveness. And uh, if we feel alive, making music, uh, sharing food with one another, being in relationship with a, with a loving and caring community, uh, and so on. Being in nature, all these things are f essentially free. They're simple. Um, now, is that regress or progress? Well, I go to uh, Arnold Toynbee, this extraordinary historian, wrote volume after volume on the history of the world. And he finally summarized these volumes of research and understanding in one principle. And he called it the law of progressive simplification, the law of progressive simplification. And he said, the measure of maturity and advance in a civilization is expressed in its ability to simplify the material aspects of life and give more energy and attention to the non-material aspects of life, the ones that we were just speaking about. So if we can advance uh, reconciliation and um, uh, the humanities uh, and, and so on and so on. If we can shift from a focus on materialism and consumerism and into with simplicity, choiceful simplicity, advancing our, our appreciation of these other dimensions of life, the non-material, that is a measure of a civilization's growth. Yeah, if we can. I guess it's the big if. Because by Toynbee's definition, uh, we're not living in, a, we're not a very mature society because we are extremely complex. 
and we have you know hugely complex systems of supply you know just in time supply chains and all right. that stuff i mean baby formula has been big in the news recently because right. a factory had to be shut down in michigan because it wasn't up to code or something and all of a sudden there's this big shortage of baby formula and they're trying to fly it in from zurich and um yeah. you know so there's so many things like that i mean if there were a huge solar flare it could burn out all the transformers in the electrical right. grid and we don't have backup transformers because no one has thought that we ought to have them on hand and we wouldn't have the means to create transformers if we had no electricity so there are a lot of things like that that are very um you know that we're very dependent upon that so far we've been lucky but you know there are a number of things that could just go wrong and then the, the dominoes would topple <laughs> Rick, uh, we're talking uplift here. Oh yeah, you kept <laughs> reminding me. Man. Oh yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> simplicity. So, well, well, I guess the question is: Is it going to be forced simplicity and or voluntary simplicity? And if voluntary. it's if it's forced simplicity because things have broken down, then there's going to be all this mayhem that you <laughs> that you've talked about and the billions of people struggling, dying, and so on. But yeah. if if we can sort of move shift to it more voluntarily, then we can avert a lot of that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think you're absolutely correct. I want to affirm what you were saying, that we've run out of time. Uh, it, it, there's no time left. Uh, the time to adapt is now, and it's it, we should have been way into this process uh, earlier. Um, so we're not going to have the luxury of voluntary simplicity. Uh, there's going to be a lot of enforced simplicity, as you're suggesting. And uh, it's going to be a rough initiation. It's going to be a rough ride for the human family. But that's the nature of initiation. And um, the pain, the loss, the sorrow, the grief, those are traumas that will teach us. And uh, we're going to learn the hard way. Uh, how to live in this uh, this new world of limitation and uh, simplicity is going to be a key factor in that learning. Yeah. And I mean, there are people like yourself who are doing it um, voluntarily. But again, if we look to Washington, they're still tinkering and denying right. and, and so on. So, I mean, I guess it's just going to get to the point where things will be forced because they haven't been chosen. That's right. That's right. So um, this is a, uh, as I said, this is going to be a rough road. It's going to be a rough ride. It's going to be a challenging uh, initiation we're go going through already. We're beginning the process right now as a species, but it's just getting started. Yeah. And I guess at this point, people might be thinking, well, what can I do? What can I do? And I, I would say, first of all, I'd, I'd go back to that quote, you know, that Marshy said on the boat ride in 1974, hold on to the self. If by whatever means you understand that to, you know, somehow know thyself, reach that, reach some stage of spiritual awakening, stabilize it, integrate it, and then you'll be better equipped to get through whatever we, are, we have to get through. Um, yes. Yes, become a full homo sapien sapien. Know that you know. Find that place of knowing within and know that knowing connects with the aliveness of a living universe. Grow in that, yes. And then what else would you prescribe? Um, I mean, you've just prescribed seven different things, you know, communications and maturity and reconciliation and all that. But, you know, what, what practical, let's say, uh, two or three immediate practical steps that people listening to this could take that would move them in the direction of greater preparedness for what, what's coming down the pike. Yeah. Well, uh, I've mentioned these already. They're very, very practical. It's the food that we eat. Um, and the, the shift towards a more vegetarian diet is just widespread now in the country and, and around the world. So it's the food that we eat. Yeah, I have a new uh, friend in, in Israel, yeah. and she, she said that about that Tel Aviv is one of the most vegan cities on the planet. It's like kind of almost the norm over there for some reason. Yes. So that's right. So the, the good point is a new normal. 
Yeah. There's a new normal emerging, and, and the food that we eat is one of the new normals. And uh, our food supply is going to be extraordinarily challenged uh, in the decades ahead. Um, so and that's a longer discussion, but uh, the food that we eat, uh, the clothes that we wear, how do we represent ourselves in the, in the world? Uh, in a consumer society, if you're not wearing the right clothes <laughs> and, and the right attire, the right shoes, the right pants, and so on, um, you're, you're looked down on. And what well, we need to reframe how we represent ourselves and what is appropriate. Uh, and look at the two of us. We each have a beard, and uh, we're a little bit... Uh, I just got a haircut so I could be on this program with you. Right? <laughs> but uh, yesterday, I didn't look anywhere as trim as I do today. <sighs> uh, so how we, you know, the clothes that we wear and how we more generally represent ourselves, uh, the the transportation we use, uh, do we really need that second car, uh, let's say? Or could we use a... a a train, a bus, and other modes of, of transportation. Really, could we do that? Well, with the internet, maybe we don't need to be commuting as much as we did in the past. So, and I think a lot of people with the pandemic are turning obviously to the internet and they're transforming. They're saying, I'm not going to go back to the office. I don't want to do all of that. Uh, I'm, I'm just as functional and effective here at home using the internet uh, and occasionally meeting with my coworkers. Uh, yeah, so there, Elon Musk just announced that if you're not going to be in the office 40 hours a week, you can leave Tesla. Yes. <laughs> and he's the one who wants to like, colonize Mars as a, as a plan B because the Earth might not make it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, um, the work, well, okay, the work that you do. Okay, well, leave Tesla. Yeah. Just, I'll say, uh, Elon, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's time for me to uh, find new work. And I'll go working, uh, go, to, go to work with an electric bike uh, company. Uh, and you can have your high-end cars and I'm going to help create electric bikes for the masses let's say uh there's a, a lot of people are doing that actually there's been a big you know layoff thing where people are just quitting because i guess there it, it kind of happened recently after the pandemic um not that the pandemic is totally over but people just thought what am i doing with my life i'm not gonna go and spend 40 50 hours a week doing this meaningless thing i've got to find something better so a lot of, That's right. i don't know what they have as a backup plan but a lot of people have just been quitting that's right. So uh, the work that we do, and I say to people, look, we each of us has what I would call true gifts. We have near gifts, things we're pretty good at, and oftentimes we're earning a living with things we're pretty good at. And we also have true gifts, and your true gift might be gardening, it might be uh, uh, the care of animals, it might be... Um, uh, woodworking. I'm, I'm not sure what your true gifts are, uh, but find your true gifts. And if it's your heart is in it, and if you're, you can bring your whole in being into it. You're not living divided anymore. You're living whole. At that point, you're a powerful force in the world. Find your true gifts. Invest your life energy in those gifts. Connect with your aliveness. Be conscious about it, and you're bringing a new new being into the evolutionary process. So um, that's another uh, thing I would suggest. Was it Joseph Campbell um, with whom you worked who said, "Follow your bliss," or was that somebody yes, else? Yes, that was Campbell. Okay, and follow how do you interpret bliss. that phrase? Well, follow your life. What brings you alive? Right. That's how I interpret. Uh, if it brings you alive, well, follow that. Yeah, which doesn't mean I want to be a rock star or something like that. Which it, it, or I want to. I Rick Archer would like to be a professional basketball player because you have to obviously go for something that suits your capabilities. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think everybody does have a dharma. And I've, I've actually yeah. interviewed people. Stephen Cope. I did a whole interview with him about dharma and finding finding what you're meant to do and what you're what you're best able to do and what you're going to evolve most quickly doing and so on. I think that's something that everybody really has to find. Yes. Good. And there's probably a lot of people in this world who are doing something that is in a simpler world, they, they could be doing something much more meaningful 
you yes. know, than sitting in a factory assembling widgets uh, all day That's long. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And uh, they they could have potentially not only one job, two or three jobs, and those jobs could be mutually supportive and reinforcing of one another. That's happening in a co-housing community. Yeah. Uh, someone yeah. might be working in the garden part of the time, uh, doing body work, massage and whatever, uh, yeah, another part of the time, cooking another part. And so a constellation of contributions could then become your livelihood, your contribution to the larger community. Yeah, that's a whole other level of discussion that we're, we're kind of in it right now. But I've often thought that in an ideal world, in a more enlightened world, there would be so many industries that now are behemoths that dominate our, our culture that yes. would absolutely have no place. I mean, you can think of that's some obvious right. ones. There wouldn't be any need for the tobacco industry, the liquor industry, the gun industry, um, you know, but all kinds of crazy financial things. I mean, the credit default swaps and all that that caused the crash in the, in the Bush, Bush administration. Everything has just gotten so complicated and um, probably wouldn't exist in, in a more enlightened world. And somehow I've often felt when I say that sort of thing that all that stuff has got to come crumbling down. It's got to be dismantled somehow. And yeah. I, don't, I just don't know exactly how that's going to happen or how traumatic it's going to be for all involved when it does. But if we're actually headed for uh, some kind of age of enlightenment, you know, your your third scenario, then that will necessitate or include the complete destruction, not destruction, just complete dismantling and yes. dissolution of such structures. Well, you mentioned just a few minutes ago uh, that we're going into an economic hurricane. Yeah, and so the the, the to be ready. They're saying uh, this is coming not in the far future, but in the near future. So the unraveling and the breakdown and moving into the collapse of these uh, big structures, big systems, and as it breaks down, we're going to have to reconfigure our lives more in a more resilient manner at the local level uh, and recreate community, live simply be more conscious, connect with our aliveness, and all the rest, things that we've been speaking about here. Yeah, so that might be might have been a good concluding statement you just made. And um, I hope everybody can see how this discussion is relevant to the overall theme of BatGap. Um, you know, uh, I've always felt strongly that spiritual awakening has to take into consideration the kinds of things Dwayne and I have been talking about today, and that it will if there if there's going to be some kind of spiritual awakening of the whole society it will in include a complete re restructuring of the way society works That's just right. as just as often happens in an individual's life when they spiritually awaken they find you know everything changes in, the, in terms of what they do what they're interested in and all that kind of stuff that's right yeah Golly, this has been a lot of fun for me, Rick, to uh, talk with you and have this conversation. So I thank you for uh, for that and for the sharing your wisdom uh, as you have. So I appreciated that a lot. Oh, likewise. I mean, this whole thing is one of my favorite topics, and you're the best guy to talk to about mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, in fact, it's funny. I should tell the people. Uh, you know, a couple of uh, years, a year or more ago you sent me a earlier version of this book i said oh boy this is great i read the first you know chapter so i said this is great i gotta interview Dwayne, and then i'll read the rest and you kept saying wait wait well, I'm, I'm putting in together some things i'm doing some videos yes. and i'm updating the book and then we'll do it so yes we finally, we finally got around to finally got there yes <laughs> um yeah thanks for your patience <laughs> oh you're right you're welcome and thank you for everything you're doing and have yeah. been doing yeah and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, next week, I'll be interviewing a gentleman named Suresh Ramas, Ramas, Ramaswamy. Ram <laughs> well, I'll get it. Um, <laughs> and uh, he has written a book called Just Be. And he seems like a very bright fellow. I'm, look I'm looking forward to delving into his work and then having a conversation Ramas with Ramaswamy. That's the way you pronounce it. I got it right. I just pronounced it wrong. Um, I got it right, but it was wrong. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's what we've got scheduled. And those, uh, you know, watching this, um, if you want to see who we have scheduled in the coming weeks and months, uh, there's an upcoming interviews page on Bat Gap. 
can check that out. And uh, there's a little thing on <clears throat> on the page with each person where you can set a reminder so that your you know your Gmail or your Outlook or whatever will pop up a reminder um, so that you can watch the live one if you want to. And it's nice to have people watching the live one and sending in questions. So I guess we're done. Dwayne, we'll we'll be in touch. I'll I'll keep sending Wonderful, you Rick. cartoons. Yeah. To yes, I'd love to do that with you. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care, brother. It's wonderful to uh, spend this time with you. Yeah. Me too. Stay in touch. Okay. Talk to you later. Okay.